So the lyrics um, that are on the screen, Ancient of Days, um, uh, that was actually the topic uh, that the Lord gave me. Uh, it seems sort of... Uh, I, I don't know who this message is for. But the Lord, I was... So, Leanne and I, we... This is an encouragement where we team teach. We were part of Beit Israel over in Orlando and uh, the um, pastor there that I love dearly, he's with the Lord, um, uh, David Pavlik Sr., who anointed me uh, into the ministry, he and his wife... Uh, used to team teach. Uh, he did most of the sharing, but uh, if she was ever given a message to share, he uh, they they like led worship together. And in a in a sense, I, I feel like we are like an offspring of them um, here in Little Falls and uh, reproducing after like kind and. Uh, everything was always done in decency and good order. Everything was always, the husband was the head of the man, and she did not, um, and it was based on the experiences uh, that the Lord gave her that she was able to share, but under his authority. And uh, it, it was just always so beautiful. It was like a dance. And it was just so beautiful. And I am forever thankful for that um, that family and uh, the Lord gave me a message uh, to speak on it was the so every morning in uh, you know I, as in my time with the Lord we we always ask Lord what is the message for your people and this so uh he gives me the music, the the songs that we that we do. <laughs> it's almost like he develops the not develops. He gives the set list, and uh, it was almost like a, a broken record. This song, "Ancient of Days," as part of the set list. Not all the songs that come on the set list are are played during worship time, but it kept coming back. So as I was looking up the lyrics, and I was I was in 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 in, in time with the Lord in worship and singing that song just as I got started in that song the next song came Let It Rain the next song came um, uh, I forget what it was um, uh, Awesome God but he then he came, brought me back to Ancient of Days and he had me circle it and he said this is what I want you to talk about so um Holy Spirit, your word is life. Your message is life. Jesus, you sent your Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.16 We regarded once Christ according to the flesh. We thus regard him no longer but according to the Spirit. You are interceding for us. And the Spirit intercedes in groanings and utterings through deep words. We don't know how we ought to pray. Holy Spirit, we don't know what we ought to say. We submit our lives to you <coughs> as broken vessels to you. Jesus, you know my shortcomings. You know my trepidation. I even wrote in my journal, Oh God, I don't know what I'm saying here. But Lord, you do. This is what makes you the ancient of days. We praise you. Holy Spirit, open the hearts. Open the minds. Open the... Uh, the eyes of the hearts of anyone who would listen to this message, that there would be no hindrance. In Jesus' name, I rebuke you from uh, stealing the word um, to be snatched from anybody. You're not going to do it. In Jesus' name. Satan, you have no interference here. You can try, but it ain't going to work. And we're not making a deal with you because this is the Lord's 
word. This is the Lord's house. This is the Lord's battle. And the people who hear are the Lord's people who would hear that perhaps they may turn and come to you in holiness because we know what the scripture says to pursue peace with all men and holiness for without which no one may see the Lord. Jesus, I pray right now that these words make us holy. You are more concerned about our holiness than our happiness. Lord, we love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so, I have scriptures here, and I think I'm not going to read them right now. Uh, but we're going to actually go through what, what we... Uh, physically saying so this this song is called Ancient of Days it's originally done by City of Light the music group out of the uh, Episcopal Church over in Australia um, the, the main text is Daniel 7 so go ahead and turn to Daniel 7 uh, verses 9 to 14 but I'll go through the lyrics of the song Daniel 7, verses 9 to 14. Um, so, and the lyrics are, Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there's still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear for this truth remains and my God is the Ancient of Days. Um, we'll go to the next verse before we go to... Um, before... Though the, uh, okay, excuse me, sorry, chorus. None above Him, none before Him, all of time is in His hands. For His throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power... All the glory, I will trust in his name, for my God is the Ancient of Days. Now, Daniel 7. Verse 9. As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head like whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands serve him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened and the books were open. Now think in terms of the next section, verse, verses 11 to 13, in terms of the nations. I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. I'm not going to get into prophetic significance. As to the rest of the beasts, their authority to rule was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions, and I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Go to Revelation 1.12. All right, Revelation one twelve. I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe with a gold sash wrapped around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, white as snow, and eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace. 
and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun at midday. Verse, uh, going up, verse 8, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is coming, the Almighty. Going to verse 17, And I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first I am the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. And that's when he talks about the, seven, the, the different stars. We're not going to go into that. And then skip over to Revelation 22. Verse I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Okay, so Leanne and I, we we love God. We love the Lord. We love Jesus. We love the Scriptures. We love His Spirit. We love everything about what He does, who He is. Why? And, and, and you know, Leanne helps me so much. I just bless her. Tremendously. Um, why is it a big deal that Jesus, the Son of Man, is the Ancient of Days? People think he's not. Well, stand by. Stand by on that, David. Um, we see in one, one more scripture, Isaiah 9. Go to Isaiah 9, verse 6. Okay. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Folks, Jesus is God in flesh. Jesus is the physical manifestation in a point in time, 2,000 years ago, where God came to dwell with man. Now, I'm sure you guys are like, uh, so what? How does that help me today? Okay. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm, I'm building anticipation. John 16. <laughs> Verse 33. I have told you these things, and he's told you, he said all about these sufferings and whatnot. He says, You, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Folks, guys, we, Walmart just said mandatory face mask requirement. There are some people that are protesting, saying, How dare you infringe on my rights? Some people are really upset about it. Okay? Some people say, this is a pandemic. This is political. Here's, here's, here's my take on it. And, and, and God had to work on me. You know, I, I, was ta- I was starting to pick sides and get upset and whatnot. Here's the point. And the Lord reproved me for this. He said, yeah, but the fact remains, 
people are getting sick. Statistics or, or not, who cares? People are dying. People are struggling. There are actual people working against this virus that are getting burned out. They're getting tired. And Jesus is saying, do you love these more than your own life? Do you? Are you willing to hurt with them? Are you willing to weep for them and say, oh, stink, there are real people hurting. There are people suffering. Okay, oh, it's politics. You know what? While this political situation is going on, you're missing the cross of Christ. God died on the cross for you, for me. And he bled for those people who are struggling in the nursing home. Some people are physically sick. I mean, they're really struggling. They're on the verge of, of, of death and potential eternal separation from God. Jesus makes it clear. He's talking to his disciples. If you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, have the Holy Spirit in you, and you have made Jesus your Lord and Savior, He is ruling in your heart. If there's 90% of Jesus and 10% not, it's all or nothing, folks. He says, You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. And I'll give you the scripture references. Colossians 1.15, he's the image of the invisible God. Verse 17, he's before all things. 2 verse 9, the entire fullness of God, of his nature, dwells in bodily form. Matthew 26.64, you will see the Son of Man coming in glory. Mark 2, 8-12, through 12, so that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. And the people after the uh, paralytic was healed, they gave glory to God. They fall down and worship Jesus as God and He never stopped them. Colossians 2.10 Okay, y'all need to go to there. Colossians 2 verse 10. This is... You can't help it. anyone. You can't minister to anyone. You can't give to anyone. You're going to want to put people at arm's length Guilty. I didn't want to... I didn't. I, there are times I'm like, I don't want to touch that person. I think, Sorry. And the Lord said, go talk to him. I don't want to. He looks ugly. Uh, that, that's human is coming out. Okay? I love what Paul says. For the love of God compels me, constrains me. Therefore, we persuade men. Verse 10. And you have been filled by him who has had over every rule and authority. Fear should not come near you. Take authority against it. In the name of Jesus, I'm not going to be afraid. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you disease. In the name of Jesus, I am more than a conqueror. He, how does this connect to the Ancient of Days? Okay, I'm, I'm, I will get there. Please, bear with me. God gave Jesus the name above every name. Philippians 2.9 Ephesians 5, the, the mystery of, of this multifaceted nature of God is Ephesians 5, where he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, the two shall become one flesh. He says this mystery is profound. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. That's the next verse. Ancient of days. Jesus came, Mark 6, 3. Is this not the carpenter? And aren't his brothers and sisters with us? Yeah, he sweat. In fact, John Gill, uh, in his commentary, says that some of the greatest uh, rabbis um, were people who worked with their hands. Um, even Hillel, I believe. Oh, what was he? Woodcutter. He was a woodcutter. Yep, yep. He was he was a uh, uh, cut lumber. Um, some was uh, some were undertakers. Some were uh, tailors. Whatnot, but they all did something physically. Jesus came and sweat along with us. Yes, He came to our need. He came to our struggle. Yes, we, um, we don't have hope outside of Him. We get tired. Our parents argue. We don't like to see them fight. They don't agree with each other. It bothers us. We, we get, I, um, it's a little personal testimony. I would go to bed crying. I would hide under my bed because my parents fought. There's never peace in my house, which which is why I turn to my addiction. Um, and I was always looking for that peace. Jesus came down when my father died in 2004. 
dear brother, uh, shared with me Psalm 139. Every day, behold, all the days of my book were written as if there were not one of them. There, it was as if there were not one of them. So not only is, is God with you in the struggle, who allowed the struggle to begin with? Go to Job. Go to Job 1. Verse 6. One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? You think God doesn't know? God knows where he was. From roaming through the earth, and, and Satan answered him, and walking around it. Now Satan's nature is to accuse. That's all he's got. It's, it's to bring a charge. And listen to what the Lord tells the enemy. He said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Listen, no one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Now, in Genesis, Cain did. Hebrews 11 tells us of Abel. God had regard for Abel's sacrifice. Did Cain not provide a sacrifice? Psalm says, you would not... 51.17 A broken heart. That's what he desires. God was there as the Ancient of Days. He said, He gave Satan right there. Satan answered, verse 9, Does Job God, uh, fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him? So, God, uh, Satan is accusing God's actions. Listen his household and everything he owns, you have blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord said, everything he owns is in your power. However, you must not lay a hand on Job himself. And then, chapter 2, verse 3. Go to Job 2, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. He still retains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to destroy him without just cause. Who knows the hearts of men? God. God. Now, Prior to Christ coming to earth, the only thing the people of Israel had was the temple. Tabernacle in the wilderness, temple during, uh, after David's reign. Uh, and then destroyed and then rebuilt. And, that's the, and then they had the priest come in once a year to the Holy of Holies, the high priest. And that, that was it. Jesus came down for us suffered, bled, died, and rose again. What does Hebrews say? Now we have access boldly to go before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. He came down with us in the trials. He went through the trials. There is not one trial that we go through that Jesus didn't go through first. Bad hair day? Guess what? He had his hair pulled out. Someone slapped, him, slapped you in the face? He got slapped in the face. Your children not listening to you? His children didn't listen to him. Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how much longer must I bear with you? People begging on him, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Okay, he goes, tried to mourn the loss of John the Baptist. 
Jesus, 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 we need you. Oh. Who here wants to get away for just peace and quiet just a moment? Just a moment, please. I just need five minutes. Five minutes, please. He said he's better. Well, no, he... Look, Jesus, they're, they're casting out devils in your name. He hit me. He's, he's, not, he's doing something and, and you... Come on, he, he went through that. Now, going back to Daniel 7, what did we read? Who allowed the plan to occur in the first place? That's the whole point. The one who came down to earth, suffer, bleed, and die, is the same one who, who allowed everything to occur that is troublesome. Even the good things. In fact, Job verse 9, 2 verse 9, he says, his wife said to him, after getting struck with boils, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die! He said, you speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. The ancient of days means he's the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, he says he's the author and finisher of our faith. He's pointing to Jesus. We want security. I want to know what's happening. I want to know what tomorrow brings. Look what's happening out there. It's not right that they're doing this to us. Actually, Romans 14 says that every governing authority has been established by who? Man? No. God. So, and they're established to punish wicked, uh, evildoers. Every circumstance is ordained by the Lord. How ought we respond when the ancient of days, for starters, one, if you wake up, you have a bad day, who allowed you to go without sleep? Who allowed you to wake up crummy? Is it not to, to challenge you? Is it not to allow the circumstance to teach you to make you holy so that you can see Jesus better? We have a dear brother. I say this with humility. He, he needs our prayers. He has an aneurysm that could burst at any moment. He struggles with a couple of debilitating conditions where he passes out just walking and severe nerve issues that he... Uh, lives in constant I can't even describe the pain that he goes through almost like a migraine cluster headache sinus headache tension headache and that doesn't even come close to the pain that he feels every day and yet in talking to him I quote the doctor who saw Dietrich Bonhoeffer go to the gallows. He said, never before have I seen such a man so submitted to the will of God. And that's my dear brother who's going through this pain and trial. Submitted to the will of God. I've never seen God such a man submitted to that. The struggles that we go through. I love what Torah says. A matter is established by how many witnesses? Two. Two! God established it in heaven. Jesus came down to earth, died, rose again, went to be with his Father. Now you have two witnesses. He suffers with you, and he ordained it. He, he allowed it. I'm not going to get into, yes, we have our own choices, whatnot. We do. God's whole purpose, His desire, is that all would what? Repent. 
repent. Turn. Turn to Him. Turn to Him and say, Jesus, I'm a mess. Whether you've been a believer for 50 years, walking with the Lord, or you've never known Him one day, He wants you to turn to Him in your waking hours. He's a living Savior. He saves you today. He saves you tomorrow. He saves you next week. He saved you yesterday. When your mom or dad yelled at you and you thought that was wrong, yeah, he was your Savior then. He'll deal with them. But he requires it of you. At the end of time, I love the song where it says here, here in the last verse, though I may not see what the future brings, I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete standing face to face in the presence of the Ancient of Days. Is God your salvation? Is Jesus your salvation? If He's not, friends, I implore you, I beg you, not just, yes, I, I came to the cross, I said a prayer, I gave my life to Him. Do you call upon Him first thing in the morning? In your rising and in your setting, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and you're sitting, you're going out, you're coming forth, is He on your thoughts? Do you say, Jesus, I need you? Guys, we need him. I need him more now. We need him more now. <sighs> um, Leanne's got a, uh, a message to share. I'm just going to pray. Thank you, Jesus, for, for these words. Jesus, I've delivered what you've said, what you've given me to say. Holy Spirit, I, I do acknowledge human frailty, but I do acknowledge your supremacy, your powerful word, your spirit that makes everything click. Bless my wife. Bless these words. Open the eyes and hearts of the hearers. Jesus, we love you and we bless you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Forgive us our shortcomings. Forgive us where we have not listened. May you have the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, just hold it. So I'm just going to pick up where um, Eric left off in Daniel 4. This is um, Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember right, he um, had built a, a mighty kingdom in Babylon. And he was very proud of his kingdom. And um, he had had a couple of run-ins with Daniel uh, at this point in time. And um, Daniel had warned him to be careful because his pride was rising up within him. And, you know, pride is one of those things uh, that says, I am good in and of myself. And we all struggle with this. It is inherent since that fall in the Adam and Eve Garden of Eden episode. We think that we know. We think we understand how life works. And it's... You know, the older you get, the more you realize you don't understand how life works. But particularly in your youth or in the height of your power and ability and strength and might, whether it be physical or mental or, um, you know, political, emotional, whatever that realm is. If you have mastery in a certain realm, the tendency is going to be to be proud. And that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He built this incredible kingdom. He's looking out over this kingdom and he sees um, how beautiful it is, how well organized it is, how many people he had taken over and he goes, wow, I must be pretty good. And he gets called on it by Daniel and he's warned and he says, don't do this king, it's God who has given you this, not you who has given you this. You haven't obtained this of your own. And then a year passes. And, and, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he seems to have received it. He seems to have received that word from Daniel. But a year passes, and it didn't really penetrate to the deepest parts of the soul. Because in that year's time, he begins to reclaim that old thinking pattern of, I have done wonderfully. And so he looks out, and he makes one of those proud statements as he's observing all that he has accomplished, so he thinks. 
And God strikes him with insanity. And he becomes like a beast. And he is now on the ground, and he's he's eating grass along with the oxen, and his nails grow out, and he is completely insane. There's actually a metaphor that, which makes you turn into an animal. Okay. Sure. So he goes along with this insanity of mind, and for seven years, a whole cycle in God's economy, if you study the Bible at all, you'll see that seven show you a complete cycle. Nebuchadnezzar is on the ground acting like a beast. You know, this is what happened to us in the fall, guys. We were upright, supposed to be before God as the ruler over the earth. Not in dominion and oppression, but as a righteous ruler over the earth. But when we fell in the fall, we sort of became like the snake, if you will. And that we fell from our position as a uh, ambassador or a ruler of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And we became like beasts. Our thinking got messed up. Our thinking got twisted. And we began to not perceive the world the way that God had intended us to perceive it. We saw the world in terms of us instead of seeing the world in terms of him who created us. And when we began to do that, we began to become uh, motivated by impulses, by uh, fleshly impulses of, of stomach and of passion and of uh, need for shelter and stuff. And if we didn't get what we felt like we needed, then we began to take it for ourselves. And uh, because our needs began to drive us, just like animals whose needs drive them to kill and to hurt and to steal if necessary. They'll steal someone else's game. You know, they'll do whatever they need to do in order to survive. And we became just like that. We became ones who needed to survive, and we felt like that fell upon us. So we became protectors of ourselves instead of looking to the Lord for protection, looking to the Lord for security. So... Nebuchadnezzar goes through a full cycle of this beast-like behavior. Okay, it's almost as if God said, okay, you want to be a beast? Here you go. You can be a beast. At the end of the seven-year uh, beast-like behavior, he gives this. So at the end of those days, this is in oh, 34 of chapter 4 in Daniel. At the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, and my sanity returned. He looks up to heaven. That's a significant thing, because up until this point in time, he's been on the earth, looking at the earth, eating from the earth, cracking around on the earth. He's been definitely, yeah, this is a, a spiritual statement here. He has been all about the earth, and now he looks up to heaven, and he sees that which is spiritual. And when he sees that which is spiritual, his sanity returns to him. Now, this sanity is not just fixing the medical condition that causes him to growl around on the, on the ground. This sanity means that he got a perspective of God in his situation. And his pride was slashed. It was broken down as he looked up and he beheld God. And this is what he says. He has a hymn. He says this, I praise the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. Any sane person, truly sane person is going to glorify God. Because they're going to recognize that, that God is God and we are not. They're going to understand that the Creator is above the creation. And they're going to give honor and glory to the One who is Maker of the heavens and the earth. So he says, for his dominion, that is God's dominion, is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. There's your ancient of days. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. This is a man who has spent the past seven years scratching around on the earth. Everybody, everything, every king, every ruler, every principality is nothing before God. And he does what he wants. 
including striking the world with a pandemic, including allowing riots, including allowing our currency to not be minted, which is causing all kinds of economic issues, including causing instability and fear. Causing? Did I just say causing? Yeah. You know what I meant? Causing. Sometimes God has a ministry of darkness. He allows us to walk in darkness so that we can see His light. You know, we don't understand how good we have it until we lose it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we need that. We need to be reminded that God is God and we are not. We have lived in a land that has been so privileged for so long. And now we are so angry that it's being taken away. But you know what? We have not beheld the face of God. We have not gloried in the Holy One. We have put God on as an accessory, like He's some sort of scarf or hat (laughs) that we put on when it fits us so that we can be comfortable. So that maybe the wind wouldn't blow too much against our ears in the wintertime. But that's not God. He's not an accessory to our life. He is instrumental to our life. He gives the very breath of life. He is the one who sustains us and holds us and keeps us. So we ought not treat him as an accessory. He does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can hold back his hand or say to him, get this, what have you done? You know, there's an awful lot of people scratching their head right now going, what in the world is God doing? Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses and realized, I better put a hand over my mouth. Just like Job says at the end of his trial, I have spoken once, I will speak no more. When God grills him and says, do you understand what I'm doing? That's the short, short version of that. You can go and look at the end of Job and read it for yourself. The answer is is that God is God and we are not. But, we do know several things about the Lord. One, He has a plan and it's a good one. His plan has been always, from the beginning of time, about salvation. About restoring us to Himself. Because our salvation was needed right from the beginning. We made bad choices right from the start. And his goal was to bring us back into union with him. And so as a result, he already had conceived of how he was going to bring us to himself because it says in the scriptures that Jesus Christ was slain slain from before the foundations of the earth, even before we were all created. And that is an amazing display of forethought and mercy and grace. So, my uh, the friend that Eris was talking about, the um, the man that is uh, struggling with this brain aneurysm and he's got neuralgia all over his body, um, he made the comment that the Lord has been teaching him things, and he said he said this to me in, in his last letter. He said, "I would not change my position for anyone else's, for the Lord has shown me so much through it." And he, he closed off his letter this. He said, one of the things the Lord has shown me is about how we mature as believers. And he said, um, read it. I don't screw it up. Um, we become what we behold. That was his, his comment, that the very first step in maturing and our understanding of who the Lord is, is that we become who we behold. And he pointed to 2 Corinthians 3. And I wanted to just look real quick. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18. And I'm reading from the Passion Translation. This is um, just as a little context. He's talking about Moses and how um, Moses, when he gave the law, 
Uh, and he went up the mountain and he saw the glory of the Lord in receiving the law. It made his face shine because the refl- it was such a glorious thing. It, um, the glory came upon him and he reflected it just like the moon reflects the glory of the sun. Okay, that's the picture. And, um, and then he would put a veil over his face and it would fade away a little bit. And then he would go back into that tent of the presence. And as he spoke with the Lord, the glory would come back. All right. But it would come and go, come and go, this kind of thing. Now, Paul is contrasting that. And he's, he's using that. He says there's a veil um, that has not yet been lifted from them that is the Jews. For it is only eliminated when one is joined to the Messiah. There's, you know, the full glory of the scriptures is not unveiled until you understand that Messiah is the fulfillment of the scripture. So you only have like a partial glory. There, I mean, the Torah is pretty glorious because it's God's words and it reflects his character. But when you understand that Christ is the living Torah and he fulfills all that was of the Torah and he is the very representation of the character and nature of God, and that's what we begin to look at as glorious. The the final like veil that stands between us and God is removed, and that glory then comes upon us. So in verse 16 it says this, But the moment that a person turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil over the Scriptures is lifted, and they see. Now the Lord that I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit and wherever He is Lord, there is freedom. And we can all draw close to Him with the veil removed from our faces. We can see clearly who God is, not just through His law, trying to understand His character. We can see the actual representation of who He is because we know what He did and what He said when He walked around on the earth and that's how He's speaking to us in these latter days, according to Hebrews. God spoke to us before through the prophets and the law, but now in these latter days, He speaks to us through His Son. And so when we look at the Son without a veil, we all become mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into His very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That transfiguration, the word there in the Greek is metamorpho, which is the same that was used of Christ when he was on the mountain and he got transfigured before his disciples. Remember what happened to him when he was transfigured? He started to shine like the sun. He was changed in his brightness. There was no veil over him any longer. He was reflecting what? The glory of who? God his Father. In fact, Jesus said, no one has seen the Father except the Son. And so he was reflecting the glory of the Father. And Paul is saying, you reflect the glory of Christ just in the same way that Jesus reflected the Father. And you do this how? Through the Spirit. You are who you behold. If you aren't shining with the glory of Jesus, and the same way that Jesus shone and reflected the glory of God, then perhaps you're beholding the wrong thing. Perhaps you're not looking at the right person. You're looking at a circumstance, or you're looking at a, a person or a Savior that's not really a Savior. And, you know, we are all worshiping something. It's in our heart to worship. So if our worship is not reflecting the object of our worship, Jesus, then we need to reevaluate. How do you know that you're reflecting the worship of Jesus? Well, you're going to have, since this process of reflection is done by the Spirit, this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, you are going to reflect the character and nature of the Holy Spirit. Well, what's the character and nature of the Holy Spirit? Who is the same as the Spirit of Christ and from the Father? They're all the same. What is it? What are the fruits of the Spirit? 
Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, right? Against which there's no law. So we'll just throw that in there for good measure. All right, so if you're not reflecting in this moment, think about your day. I'm not condemning anybody, but think about your day. Are you anxious? Where's the peace? Are you gentle with people when they disagree with you? Or are you fighting? Are you full of love? Towards those who are struggling, who are disadvantaged? Are you kind? Are you long-suffering with those who keep saying the same thing over and over and over again? Or even with our government, who can't figure out what to do in this situation? Are we praying for them, or are we complaining about them? Which one's more fruit of the Spirit like? Where's your heart? What are you reflecting? Are you reflecting the fact that the Ancient of Days has this in control? Are you reflecting the fact that you're irritated that you're having to go through it? Mm. This is why the Ancient of Days matters. You see, you are what you believe. And you could say with your mouth that you believe a certain thing, but if your actions don't show it, show me your faith by your actions, James says. It is your actions that count. And I'm not talking about going out and feeding the the, the hungry or clothing those who are naked. I mean, those are good things. I'm talking about how do you act in your words? How do you act in your thoughts as you think about these different things? Are you reflecting the glory of Jesus Christ? And he had it much harder than we did. Rome was way worse than the American government, I guarantee you. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to behold the risen Son. Amen. Look on Him this week. Amen. Question yourself. Does this reflect the glory of God? Amen. Be devoted to Him. Love Him. Worship Him. Get quiet before Him and ask Him, Holy Spirit, where am I not beholding you? Where are my thoughts not lining up with your thoughts? How am I not being sane? Where is my insanity? Where am I acting like a beast before you? Forgetting that you are in control of all things. Let's be like Nebuchadnezzar and praise the God of heaven and earth, the one who is from generations to generations. The one who has everything in control. All people on earth and every heavenly army. Jesus died and rose again, putting all things under his feet. All powers, every circumstance is under his control. And nothing is truly chaotic. Only from our perspective. Let's start acting like it. Amen and amen. Thank you, Father for your word which gives us security and peace. May we walk out as emissaries for you, proclaiming that thine is the kingdom. Yours is the power. It's all yours. And yours is the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. 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 Um, so we're going into communion. Um, and what I wanted to do, brothers and sisters, this is a very um, difficult message, at least for me, uh, because it's, we got a lot of stuff going on in the world. Um, but I want us, and, and those of you who are not able to make it, but to... We're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We're going to sing it twice. Sing just the chorus. Um, because it illustrates, if you are not looking like Jesus, then you should be asking yourself, are you looking at Jesus if you're not looking like Jesus? And it's not just one day. It's every waking moment. Now, don't get me wrong. There is sanctification. This is a process. 
God is more concerned about your holiness than your happiness. He's more concerned about you looking like Jesus with, with each growing day. But the hymn really points it out. It, it, it goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Okay. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Leanne, go ahead and lead it. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth grow strangely in the light of His glory and 